Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you today and to have a chance to introduce our first speaker in this year's Empire Lecture Series. My name is Tony Afenia. I'm from Providence College, and I'm delighted to introduce a colleague I've known for many years, uh, Dr. Z uh, Zoltan Hajnal from uh, the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Zoli is professor of political science. He's a scholar of racial and ethnic politics, urban politics, immigration, and political behavior. He is the author of White Backlash, Immigration, Race, and American Politics from Princeton, 2015. And uh, that book was a choice outstanding academic title. Why Americans Don't Join the Party, Race, Immigration, and the Failure of Political Parties to Engage the Electorate is from Princeton, 2011. And that book was a winner of the APSA's Best Book on Race and Ethnicity, the Bunch Award. Is that the Bunch Award? No, OK. That was the Rep Award, Rep Section Award, yes, Section of Race, Ethnicity, and Politics Annual Book Award. Uh, he's also the author of a book I've used in class many times called America's Uneven Democracy, Race, Turnout, and Representation in City Politics, uh, which was the winner of APSA's Best Book on Urban Politics in 2010. Do you write any books that don't win the Best Book Award, Zoli? <laughs> he also authored Changing White Attitudes Towards Black Political Leadership in 2006. Uh, Professor Hajnal's uh, research has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, and a range of other media outlets. Uh, dangerously Divided, uh, the topic of today's lecture, How Race and Class Influence Who Wins and Loses in American Politics as, as America. Has be, as America has become more diverse, uh, the nation has become more racially divided polity. This presentation will document the growing racial divide and highlight its consequences for the representation and well-being of racial and ethnic minorities. Please join me in welcoming Professor Zoltan Hajnal uh, to the stage. Zoli. Thank you, Tony, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for uh, showing up today. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, we have a limited amount of time, so I'll hop right into it. Um, if we think about it a little deeply, there are two very different views of how race works in American society more generally and in American politics uh, in particular. And those two views are very uh, conflictual or contrasting. So on one side, there's the perception uh, and I think lots of pieces of uh, individual pieces of evidence that we are moving towards a post-racial society. So uh, we have more and more minority elected officials at higher and higher office. We have Barack Obama. We also have more broadly uh, increasing rates of interracial marriage, uh, expanded multiracial identification, both of which are sort of seem to be blurring the lines across racial and ethnic groups. And all this, by some uh, arguments, is leading to uh, younger Americans, millennials, growing up in a world that's more diverse and more accepting of racial and ethnic difference. And again, all this is, is, is a positive development pointing towards a post-racial society at some point, if, if not uh, that far in the future. On the other hand, we have a whole range of more negative developments. So in uh, presidential elections, we have Trump talking about Muslims, Trump talking about Mexicans and rape and crime and those sorts of things, and obviously not limited to, to Trump as well. And then we have um, different uh, voter ID laws being passed in all kinds of different states, which we think are excluding minorities. And we have Ferguson. We have Flint. We have all these incidents of racial violence, which seem to suggest that racial discrimination and racial inequities are actually quite uh, widespread uh, in our society and in our polity. So given these two different views, what is sort of the reality? And, and that's where, I guess, social scientists often come in. So can we provide systematic analysis that gives us a sense of how race actually does work in American politics? I won't make too many claims about society in general, but in the political sphere, how does race work? In order to do that sort of in a hopefully empirically objective way, we'll look at some key indicators. Think first about division. So uh, what are the factors, the demographic factors that lead us to, to vote one way or another or that divide us? And then look at how that affects minority representation. So uh, how well represented are we in terms of who's winning office, which kinds of voters? are successful and which kinds of policies are being passed. And then lastly, we'll think a little bit about solutions. And, and I don't know if my solutions are actually attainable, but uh, we'll talk about them anyway. Okay, so here's the, the story that I think the numbers will show. 
uh, as has already sort of been suggested, as America has become more diverse, we have become more divided uh, uh, as a polity in terms of race and ethnicity. And those racial divisions lead to the underrepresentation of racial and ethnic minorities on any number of different indicators that we think are important to, to look at. Uh, all quite negative, but at the end of the day, there is at least one uh, factor that, that leads to a lessening of the racial imbalance in minority representation or in representation, and that's Democratic Party control. So I'll try to, in 20 minutes, walk us through all these different things. So again, we're going to start with the vote. Um, what divides us and how, how big of a role does race play? Here's a snapshot, the most recent national election. Uh, we've got the share of blacks, Latinos, Asian Americans, and whites supporting uh, Democratic candidates in the House in 2014. Uh, pretty obvious, you see 90% roughly of African Americans supporting Democratic candidates, almost two thirds of Asian Americans and Latinos supporting Democratic candidates, and then on the other side, uh, a little less than two thirds of whites supporting Republican candidates. So, Judging by this one election, most racial and ethnic minorities on one side, uh, most whites on the other. Is this one election unique? And the answer is absolutely not. So here we have uh, a series of elections uh, from 2006 to, to 2012, uh, everything from presidential contests down to state senate, state house. And what you see is nothing changes across the different elections. The patterns are, are very clear. Blacks, uh, the Arab, uh, blacks are about 50 points more Democratic, typically, than are whites. But you also have also a very large Latino-white divide, about 20, 25 points, and a slightly smaller but reasonably large Asian-American-white divide, about 20 points or a little bit less. And again, it's consistent across all the different contests. So it seems like race is dividing us pretty thoroughly. Now, one thing to sort of, you see this and say, okay, well, how big is this racial divide? The, the way to sort of assess that is to compare it to other factors that we think are important, other demographic factors that, that might be dividing us. So here we have the, the vote in uh, 2012, the presidential contest. Um, and what we're doing here is looking at the predicted effect of each of these different factors. So it's, it's race versus class versus religion, age, gender, and so on and so forth. And controlling for, e for the other factors, how much of an independent effect does each demographic characteristics have. And as you see just visually, race dominates uh, the picture. So even after controlling for class, gender, and so on and so forth, um, blacks are about 52 points more likely uh, to support uh, one side, or in this case, a Democratic candidate. Uh, Latinos about 27 points, and uh, Asian Americans about 14 points. Other things matter, but interestingly, despite the, the growing economic inequality in this nation, class plays very little role once you uh, control for class. And class works in different ways depending on which indicator you're looking at. So the traditional left-right class politics doesn't seem to be playing a major role in how we choose candidates. Um, religion is the second most important factor in our politics, and other factors are, are relatively small. So if we think about American politics, it, it seems to be, at least judging by the vote, primarily about race and then secondarily uh, about religion. Um, and these racial divides are, are quite large and perhaps troubling. Um, the, the fact that we have most whites on one side, increasingly, and most uh, Af uh, racial and ethnic minorities on the other, means that our party system is increasingly a, a racialized party system of two racial orders. So back in uh, the mid part of the uh, so 1950s, both parties were largely white parties. More than 90% of the voters who supported the Democrats were white. More than 90% of the voters who supported the Republicans were white. Um, but as we become more diverse as a nation, that changes for the Democratic Party. So today, about half of all Democratic voters are racial and ethnic minorities. By contrast, not a lot changes for the Republican Party. So today, Republicans get about 90% of their support from white Americans. And this is a story reasonably, I think, well known, but it is uh, troubling that you have these sharp uh, racial divisions, and it's troubling I think for the following reasons, and that is we live in a democracy and that democracy counts votes. Whites are preferring different candidates from racial and ethnic minorities uh, for the most part, and uh, whites are still the majority of the population. You do the logic, uh, the majority wins, the minority loses. Does that mean that we have 
widespread tyranny of the white majority. So that's, a, I think, a real concern given the numbers we've seen so far. There's lots of factors that could g prevent that tyranny of the majority. You've got the courts, you've got different institutions, um, and so it's not a one-for-one -one outcome, and so we do want to sort of think about uh, representation. And so there's a lot of different things we could look at. I want to highlight two key markers, one very standard, which kinds of candidates win, uh, and then a second, I think slightly newer measure that, that we have new data that we can sort of address more closely, which kinds of policies are passed and in the sense which kinds of voters are winning or which kinds of residents are winning when, when policies are passed. Okay, so looking first at uh, descriptive representation. So there's a, there's a positive story here to begin with. Number one, uh, the number of racial and ethnic minorities in office has gone up and gone up dramatically and consistently over time. So back in the early 1960s, there were effectively no racial and ethnic minority elected officials other than a few African Americans, uh, a few Latinos in small, uh, often rural or, or, or townships. Um, that changes. Every year you have more and more and to the point where uh, most recent data have us at about 10,000 black elected officials, including mayors of many of the largest cities, including obviously the president. These are important gains, important gains for Latinos as well, and less you know, numerous, but also very important gains for Asian Americans. So it looks like minorities have more and more power over time, and that's uh, important development that we, should, that we should note. On the other hand, if we, if we look at the numbers compared to the size of each racial group's share of the population, it's a much more discouraging story. So, in this figure, we have the share of, of each racial and ethnic group as, as a share of the population. Blacks about 13%, Latinos about 17%, Asian Americans about 5 or 6%. And then we compare that to the, their shares of local offices, uh, state legislat legislatures, easy for me to say, the House of Representatives, and the Senate. And in every case, for every racial and ethnic group, they're, they're greatly underrepresented. So rather than uh, matching their 13% of the population, blacks are getting 5, 8, 10, or 1% of these particular offices. Latinos probably even more underrepresented, and Asian Americans equally underrepresented. So all three groups doing relatively poorly. Um, there is some interesting variation. So you see better outcomes in the House, suggesting that, that districting, drawing lines, does help minority representation. You see some of the worst numbers in the Senate, suggesting that our system uh, of apportioning you know, relatively equal uh, power to states that are smaller, more rural, uh, is very much hurting racial and ethnic minorities. So some of this is explained by institutions, some might be explained by a range of other factors. Now, there are objections to what I've just, just done. So counting up the number of blacks, Latinos, and Asian Americans and saying that's representation has merits for, for certain, uh, but there are, it is assuming, number one, that minorities favor minority candidates. We know they often do, but we know that they sometimes don't. We know, for example, we might make a claim that uh, uh, Ted Cruz winning the presidency might not further minority interests a lot, uh, but by the measures we've looked at so far, he would count as uh, uh, an exemplar of minority representation. The other side of the assumption is that whites can't represent minority interests, so if Hillary Clinton wins uh, in November, that's not going to further minority interests at all. So it's going to totally dismiss that as representation for minorities. So we probably want to look at something else. And I think ultimately what we care about is government policy. So what is it the government actually does? And does what government, uh, the, does the policy the government enact follow the preferences of one group considerably more than any other group? So what uh, I've done with a series uh, of co-authors, highlight David Searle, graduate student, hire him. Uh, he's really good. They did most of the work uh, and, and, and others. Um, we're basically, what we're looking at is uh, individual spending preferences about the federal government. Uh, and comparing those individual spend, spending preferences to what the federal government does. So do you want more spending on military, uh, on the military industrial complex? Uh, or do you want less? Or do you want the same? Is the question we ask or the general social, social survey asks. And then we have what the government does in the following year. Does the government actually spend more on the military? Does it spend less? Does it spend the same? And do, do, do you get what you want is essentially what we're trying to uh, explain here. And we have that across 38 years, 11 policy domains that cover most of the federal budget, and about a half, a little under half a million individual preferences on these policies. You add all that up, 
and this is the pattern that you get. So this is the percent of each demographic group that ends up as policy winners across this entire time span and across all these different array of policies. And what you see that is in terms of uh, gender, uh, religion, age, the, the, the bars are all about the same level. They're relatively flat. These, those factors aren't explaining who's winning and who's losing very much. Not much for income, a little bit for education, but the big factor uh, is, again, race, I guess, as you would expect, given the, racial, the, the sharp racial divide. Blacks are the big losers in this process. So they're about 6% less likely to get their preferences met than are whites. Uh, Latinos, somewhere in the middle. Asian Americans look relatively advantaged here. That's uh, a, a bit of a, uh, an exaggeration based on the data. The problem is the GSS only asks about Asian Americans for the te last 10 years. So that figure is, strictly speaking, not comparable to the others. If you only look at the last 10 years, Asian Americans are about as likely to get what they want as white Americans are. So the uh, story would not probably be that they're, they're that advantaged. But again, big story here. Race seems more than anything else to be structuring uh, which kinds of Americans get their policies passed and, and in essence structuring representation. Some uh, objections or maybe explanations for that pattern. Maybe it's not about race. Maybe it's the fact that African Americans are disproportionately liberal. They want to spend more money when governments are constrained. African Americans are disproportionately democratic as we've seen. Maybe it's Democrats who are losing and not, not really African Americans. Maybe it's that uh, African Americans just are a minority with unique preferences, they, they vote more often against the plurality. Uh, so all those could be explaining that, that, that imbalance, that racial imbalance. So what we did is simply we added variables to control for each of this. So do you want more spending or not? Are you a liberal? Are you a Democrat? Uh, and did you vote, or did you favor, and vote's the wrong word there actually, did you favor a policy that the plurality opposed or not? Uh, and when you do that, run a regression and you get the predicted effects of each of these factors you get exactly the same story. So again, just visually, here's the difference in probability of whites and blacks winning. Whites are still 5% more likely to get their policy preferences met uh, than, than African Americans, even after controlling for demographics and your policy preferences and your politics. Um, there are class effects uh, as well. So class effects are important here. There are some uh, effects for religion. There are also some effects for politics. So Democrats, are uh, less likely to get their policy preferences met than Republicans over this time period, uh, and also uh, liberals doing less well than slightly less well than conservatives. But again, at the end of the day, what's explaining who's winning in policy after controlling for all these other things is race more than anything else, and it's African Americans who are on the losing side. Um, and uh, we can debate about how you know how important a five-point difference is, but we can't sort of debate the fact that that race even more than politics, is leading some groups to, to lose more than others. Um, so this is somewhat problematic. Is there anything that we can do about it? One might think about pointing to party and party control as a key variable. So after all, we've already seen minorities favor Democrats much more, um, and so maybe they're favoring Democrats because they have policies that are productive for minorities. Um, so that's a possibility. On the other hand, the Republicans make very strong claims that their policies serve minority interests. So it's sort of a he said, she said. Again, that's when we as social scientists should be able to come in uh, and provide data. So what we do is relatively simple. We compare policy outcomes when Democrats are in charge to policy outcomes when Republicans are in charge. And we're using the same model. We've got all, you know, the half million policy preferences. And do they match what the government, federal government does? And we're simply adding in uh, control of the presidency and Congress. And when you do that and run the numbers and run your regressions and get your predicted effects, you see fairly stark patterns. So when Republicans are uh, in charge of the presidency, the gap between uh, the responsiveness to whites and, and blacks is quite high, about uh, predicted to be about eight points, eight and a half points. It's about half when Democrats, uh, reduced to about half when Democrats are in charge of the presidency. Likewise, when you have a uh, Republican or divided Congress, a large racial and ethnic imbalance, and a much, much smaller one when Democrats are in charge. And then when you have a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress, you essentially have even representation by race. Slight, very slight advantage for African Americans, but under, those, under that one 
context is the one time period when blacks are not uh, significantly disadvantaged in the policy arena. Um, then one finally, one, I think, last test, which I think is the most important test. So we've talked about a descriptive representation, we've talked about policy, but at the end of the day, you know, our government is, uh, the, the main goal is to further the well-being of individuals, right? So does any of this, at the end of the day, matter for who wins and who loses in life, in society, on core outcomes? And we can look at that as well. Um, so what I've done with another co-author is sort of trace the well-being of racial and ethnic minorities and white Americans uh, under, over time under different partisan regimes. So we're here, we're looking at median income uh, by race, we're looking at poverty rates by race, unemployment by race. Are these things affected by our uh, politics and uh, our party, by party control? And it looks like they are. So here is party of the president and annual changes in well-being for African Americans. Um, and you see we've got about 50 years of data, depending on which measure we're talking about, but across all these years, on average, under Democratic presidents, uh, black incomes go up about $900 a year. By contrast, they only go up about $140 a year under Republicans. You have a significant and substantial difference. Uh, black poverty rates go down 2.4 points under Democrats. They actually go up under Republicans. Black poverty goes down by about a third under Democrats, it goes up by about a third under Republicans, and all these differences are large and significant. If you add up all the years, so again, about 50 years of data, give or take, this is what you see. Dramatic differences, so under all the years of Democratic presidencies, black poverty went down 38 points. Under all the years of Republican presidents, black poverty went up three points. Black unemployment down eight points under Democrats, up 14 points under Republicans and large differences in income as well. So extrapolating well beyond the data, non-social science, uh, uh, who knows, but if you were to say we would have had Democratic Party control over this entire 50-year period, it's conceivable that most of the racial inequality that we see in America would be gone, conceivable. Um, okay, so it's important to sort of think about, okay, maybe the Democrats just got lucky, these uh, patterns exist after we control for the economic conditions going into the presidency, so lag median income, inflation, GDP, all those sorts of things. The other important factor to note is these differences are even greater when you look at the second term of a presidency. So if it's just that Republicans got lucky and Repub uh, the Democrats got lucky and Republicans got unlucky, you would think that second terms wouldn't have the, the same difference, and in fact they have as sharp or more sharp differences in terms of the well-being of different groups. We've looked at blacks. We can do the same thing for Latinos and Asian Americans. We have a lot fewer years of data, so it's more speculative. Only one difference is significant, but the pattern is exactly the same. Racial and ethnic minorities doing very well under Democrats on these core indicators of well-being, uh, and racial and ethnic minorities doing relatively poorly on core indicators of well-being under Republicans. Um, okay, so adding all that up together, this is, I think, the story that I, I want uh, all of us to come away with, uh, if you believe me, and hopefully you'll have questions to, quest to, to, to get further information about this, but as we have become a more racially diverse society, we have become more racially divided. We have more and more uh, two parties, uh, one of which is an increasingly white party or a white party, and the other of which is a racially diverse party, and I think that's uh, troubling, and, and that racial divide is greater than any of the other divides that we see in terms of demographics, significantly greater. Um, that racial divide, the fact that whites are the majority still, means that uh, minorities are shut out of many, many offices. So despite the fact that we're a diverse nation, about 90% of our elected officials are still white. Um, and our policies favor whites and white preferences and white interests substantially more than they favor uh, the preferences of racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, again, all that I think is, is, is really troubling and is something we might want to do something about. Um, I have no idea how we get more Democrats in office. Uh, so the, the, the but part about this is speculative in, in some sense, but having Democrats in power does appear to reverse most of the racial imbalance and representation that we have in American politics. And so uh, if we care about racial and ethnic minorities, it's something that we should be pushing uh, hard for. And I'll stop at that point. And
Thank you. So my question is, what do those charts look like at for white people? Because the implication is that if blacks are worse off, possibly whites are better off, but it's not obvious to me. Okay, right. yeah. So and the, what's the, if you compare Democrats and Republicans for Anglos, what do you get? Okay, so uh, Professor Amy Bridge, thank you very much for that, that great question. That, uh, you know, so the, I mean, the, the politically important part of the patterns th that we haven't looked at is that whites actually are not worse off under Republicans. So whites, if you, if you did the same table for whites, they're not uh, a lot better off under Democrats than they are under Republicans, but they are slightly better off in terms of income. Uh, poverty rates and unemployment rates. So essentially, everybody is better off. Um, now, whites are losing, relatively speaking, to minorities. So if you look at the gap between whites and minorities, it decreases under uh, uh, Democratic uh, administrations. And so if you're white and you care about your absolute well-being, you're going to vote Democratic. If you're white and you care about your relative well-being and the racial hierarchy, then you might vote Republican. Uh, but it is absolutely important to note that, that whites are doing uh, well under Democrats uh, in addition to, to racial and ethnic minorities. Thank you for that very nice uh, presentation. Uh, this is somewhat speculative, and I'm sorry to put you in the spot, but um, we have two Democratic candidates, one who appeals to a white base but could represent black voters, and one who knows how to appeal to the black voters. And uh, in just sort of trying to speculate on bridging this racial divide, uh, do we want more of the Sanders type uh, candidate or do we want a Clinton type candidate? Okay, yeah, and uh, my honest answer is I don't know, uh, but I'm happy you know, to, to talk about it anyway and, and, and uh, speculate a little bit. Um, you know, so, and, and to get at that answer, the, the key would be to look at what policies under Democrats are driving the, the greater responsiveness and the greater outcomes for racial and ethnic minorities. Problem with that is, you know, we can come up with a list of a thousand different possibilities and we have 50 years of data and so it's hard to know which, you know, it's hard, just numerically hard to, to make a connection. Maybe if we reduce this down to the state level, we have more variation and we could look at policy. So I think that's a fruitful area for research in this. Um, but in terms of, you know, potential culprits, there's a set of uh, racially explicit policies that, that could have uh, helped here. Um, there's a set of redistributive policies, so welfare, uh, taxation, that maybe is a big factor. Um, and then there's sort of everything else. Um, one thing we do know is that under Democrats, the economy grows more than it does under Republicans. Um, and so just better stewardship of the economy matters. And we know that at least until recently, growing economies were critical for racial and ethnic minority well-being. So if I'm speculating, I'm thinking more about uh, policies that grow the economy rather than about uh, specifically uh, policies on welfare, policies on race. Does Sanders have a better grow, uh, set of policies to grow the economy than Clinton? Uh, and that one I think I'd leave to the economists. Uh, I don't know. Um, Philip Howe, Adrian College, I'm, and I confess I'm the person who wrote the Choice Review originally. Um, I have a question about, uh, actually about the book White Backlash. In there, you point out that there's this growing racial polarization, but you also argue historically you can expect in the long run that the party's going to realign and compensate for that. Do you think the current crisis in the GOP could actually be jump-starting that process? Um, yeah, so the question, you know, will, so the, you know, I argue elsewhere that, that Republicans have, uh, are using immigration, the immigrant threat narrative, to garner more and more white votes. But at the end of the day, given the, the demographics of the country, uh, targeting more and more white voters at some point is not going to be a successful strategy. Um, I actually don't think we're there yet. Uh, prim you know, I think Republicans are going to have a very hard time with the presidency, regardless of who's running and, and what kinds of agendas they're putting forward. Uh, but if you look at who's controlling most of the government of the United States, Republicans are controlling the Senate, the House, they're controlling the two-thirds of uh, the state legislature. So they're, they're still very successful, and the incumbents in that process have no reason to shift their policies or their rhetoric because they're still winning with the agenda that they have at this point. So there'll be lots of Republicans saying, we absolutely need to shift on race and on immigration, but there'll be a lot of others saying we're doing absolutely fine 
uh, as we are and will want to continue. So there'll, there'll be divisions um, uh, unless the Republicans lose the Senate or the House or something very, very dramatic happens. I don't foresee, at least in the very short term, uh, much, much changing on, on that front. Hello, yeah, my name is Lamar Bennett, and I wanted to ask you um, a question about redistricting. Do you think, like I noticed in your presentation that you were saying that minorities don't have that much representation, that, you know, on all of those types of things. So I wanted to more ask the question, or if you've done in your analysis, the role that redistricting, redistricting plays in the uh, undermining of minority political power because of the changing demographics of the United States, it seems to me that that it's not really reflective in Congress because of these gerrymandered districts. In a lot of ways, I feel that the I guess the you know the people, the powers that be, draw the districts in a way to maintain their own political power. So minorities, all minorities really don't have that much representation. So I was just curious about your views on that and whether or not you uh, plan to explore that in your analysis. Thank you for your presentation, I appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, I absolutely, I think uh, districting plays a role. Uh, I have not done any research on it. A lot of smarter pol political scientists than me have done lots of really interesting, important research on it. I think the answer is complex. So racial gerrymandering is effective in getting more descriptive representation but it may be problematic in terms of getting more substantive representation. Um, but, but the bigger issue is that Republicans control redistricting in the vast majority of cases, and they are doing more than anything else, they're doing partisan gerrymandering, which means that Republicans uh, are, are gaining disproportionately, uh, and, and given that racial minorities are not supporting the Republican Party in large numbers, that means that they're losing out because Republicans are gaining. The other complication with that is we are, uh, how we are distributed across the nation is difficult for Democrats. So Democrats are, tend to be concentrated, heavily concentrated in larger urban areas. Republicans more dispersed uh, in, uh, in more rural areas and not, as, and not as exclusively Republican. And so it's easier to draw more and more Republican districts than it is to draw uh, evenly split uh, are slightly advantaged districts to, for the Democratic Party. So it's, there's a structural problem, there's a Republicans in charge problem, and then there's a debate and, and a potential conflict between minority descriptive representation and minority substantive representation. Um, in the first few sets of data, you're trying to control for class to show that this is really a race-based effect. But then with the income and employment data, I'm curious, I know Larry Bartels has published some charts that are very much like yours, but instead of race, it's you know 80th percentile of income versus 20th and finds inequality goes down or is flat under Democrats while rising rapidly under Republicans. Have you looked at if there's a way to divide how much of this is just a Democrats have been better on inequality and for low income versus how much is specifically race? Right, and I, um, so uh, truth be told, uh, this is a copy of uh, Larry Bartels and that analysis is absolutely, you know, he's the one who, uh, who started it. Um, you know, what you can do is, is try and control for inequality, uh, changes in the economy and see which parts of the uh, minority income growth is, how much of that is re reduced after you control for those. Um, there's a lot of collinearity, but I think that's a big part of the story. Uh, and I'd like to sort of underline that in the presentation, there's a lot of is it race or is it class? The reality of our society is that race and class are closely intertwined. And so the debate really shouldn't be is race driving us or is class driving us, but how can we get policies uh, and, and representation for disadvantaged Americans either uh, based on economic status or based on racial status. And if we can do that, then we can probably help both sets of groups. So uh, yeah, underlining that uh, they're intricately related and, and the growing inequality under Republicans is, is very much part of driving the growing racial, the growing economic inequality under Republicans drives some of the growing racial inequality under Republicans as well. And I, I couldn't give you an exact number on that at all. I have a little bit more of a nuanced question to segue into his. When you were doing your research, did you look at specifically at African Americans and see what the class divisions were within that 
division there. I'm just interested to see if maybe more affluent blacks were more likely to vote for white candidates and whether the less affluent were and less educated were more likely to vote in favor of the black candidates. Sure, and, and uh, there's a large literature trying to sort of understand class divisions within the African American community. I think that the short answer is there aren't really massive class divides uh, in the political choices that African Americans make, despite the fact that there's a lot of economic inequality and lots of middle class blacks. Um, on a lot of these indicators, what you find is middle class blacks are in fact more democratic than, than working and lower class blacks. Um, when in the policy responsiveness, we find that when you look at an interaction between race and class, um, there, there, it, it isn't the fact that middle class blacks are getting responded to a lot and lower class blacks not. So th there really isn't a within uh, race dynamic. It's really about African Americans, uh, as far as we can tell. There are some issues on which uh, class is maybe beginning to divide African Americans, uh, some of the new research coming out, but I don't see a lot of that uh, here. The one sort of interaction that's really interesting, and the one group that's most disadvantaged in this process is African American women. So blacks are disadvantaged, uh, and then black women are significantly more disadvantaged uh, uh, in terms of policy responsiveness. I have a more nuanced question too. So with the spending categories, did you break it up and look at particular topics and see if uh, on one category the inequality was particularly large, like on education or something like that, and that would fall back into the outcomes that you're looking at? Um, and then also in what direction? So like they want more and they get less? Is that usually what's, I mean, that's uh, an assumption, okay. I guess, that okay. I would think is true, but I'm just wondering. I don't know why they would get more, or get, uh, yeah, it would be the opposite. Okay, so the second one's sort of easier. Um, Blacks uh, lose either lose when they want more spending, and they also lose when they want less spending. Um, so, you know, military spending, they want less, they get more. Um, if you look across every one of the 11 policy areas, blacks are significantly disadvantaged. Uh, but there is a silver lining to the pattern. So they seem to be somewhat less disadvantaged in the policy arena on areas that we think African Americans care more about. So welfare spending being one, spending on cities being another. Um, so they're still disadvantaged, but not as much. So um, whether that's because uh, our, pol our political representatives recognize that this is important and are therefore more responsive or some other factor is driving that, but it's not. So there's a, a bleak story in that uh, unequal responsiveness across every policy area, but a somewhat encouraging story in that it's at least attenuated on things that African Americans, uh, we think, care a lot about. Question. Uh, I'm wondering about a couple other uh, changes, uh, racially div divergent uh, policy areas. One of those is incarceration rates uh, for blacks, whites, Latinos, and Asians, and Native Americans. And the other is voter turnout rates. Uh, I, th I think both of those are relatively accessible data uh, series. Uh, I'm also curious about police violence and um, uh, for which there's much less robust data, but do you have any thoughts on how those might look uh, in your series? Sure, yeah, and so uh, in terms of looking at uh, outcomes and policies, uh, we looked also at, at some criminal justice outcomes. So to, at what rate are African Americans incarcerated uh, under Democrats and Republicans? And you see uh, the same pattern of difference. So, and that, you know, I actually neglected earlier to to talk about criminal justice, but that I think is another important area that could be driving a lot of the differences in outcomes uh, under Democrats versus Republicans. So I, you know, I think that's another very fruitful area, and and the numbers are dramatic in terms of both the level of uh, incarceration, number one, and also the differences between Democrats and Republicans in, in rates of incarceration. So um, yeah, very fruitful. And in terms of turnout, turnout is a big part of the story. Uh, in the sense that uh, whites turn out at much higher rates than racial and ethnic minorities. That's one area where after you control for class, uh, there isn't typically much of a large racial divide, um, but it's, a, I think, a critically important factor that matters a lot for minority representation, in particular for Latino and Asian American representation, a little bit less so for African American representation, simply because blacks turn out uh, at higher rates than those other two groups and almost uh, are at the same rate uh, as whites. So uh, 
Uh, but it's, uh, we, we, you know, we should care about divisions in the vote, and we should also very much care about who's voting and can we reduce uh, di uh, differences in, in who's participating. So I guess that's it. Yes, that's it. Okay. Uh, let's give uh, Professor Hajnal another round of applause. And just as importantly, I want to give him his official thanks okay, from thank the Midwest you. Political Science Association. And there may be some financial uh, compensation there as well. Thank you very much. It's all going to research, for sure. <laughs> nice thank job. You. Thank you.